Um, good morning. Um, I'm just looking at the attendance there. Um, we have um, a few more joining on at the moment. Um, so, but I'll just to start the introductions, I'd like to, to welcome you to our breakfast bite on uh, the Safe Catering Pack. My name is, is Lisa O'Connor um, and I'm uh, um, a member of the, the Food Science and Standards um, uh, uh, section of the Food Safety Authority. And this morning, I'm going to uh, give you a, a very brief introduction to food safety management systems. I'm going to be joined then by my colleague, Carol Heavey, who will go through the Safe Catering Pack. Carol, um, so for those of you who have never used the pack, Carol will introduce you to it. And then for those of you who are already using the pack, she will go through the, the recent updates um, that, we've, that we've made. We're then um, going to be joined by um, our colleague Gwen Bassa from the Environmental Health Service. And she's going to give uh, the perspective of, of environmental health officers um, in terms of when they, they see the pack um, in use on, on the ground. Okay, so starting with food safety management, I suppose just to, to give you a recap and warm you up. Um, uh, in terms of um, what food safety ha hazards need to be managed and how do we manage them uh, is what we're going to go through in, in the next uh, few minutes. So these are the typical three hazards that we think about when we're, we're looking at food safety hazards. A, a, an example of a biological hazard would be harmful bacteria in raw meat. So for example, we know that we handle chicken, raw chicken very carefully and we try and prevent cross-contamination and we make sure we cook it thoroughly. And in recent years, um, in particular because of the increased contamination with Compilobacter on chickens, um, we have reminded people that it is important not to wash raw chicken. Uh, because that can spread harmful bacteria around the sink and onto to the counter surfaces in, in, in the kitchen. In terms of chemicals, um, an example might be using unsuitable packaging material. So for example, some packaging is designed to be suitable to use with hot foods, whereas other packaging, if used with hot foods, um, uh, if it's not designed for that purpose, harmful chemicals may start to leach into, into the food. So always be sure you're using uh, appropriate packaging. And then I suppose the physical hazards is something that uh, um, it's very easy to be aware of. Um, things break and things go wrong. Um, pieces of glass or metal can get into food. And so you um, always have to be vigilant to make sure that you, um, you prevent that from happening. So maybe if you if you pause here and have a think about if there's another hazard in 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 your business um, that you've been thinking about recently and trying to control, and in particular, um, I would say that it's a type of chemical hazard, and this is um, allergens. So while allergens are considered to be chemical hazards, many businesses nowadays choose to treat allergens as a fourth hazard when they're doing their hazard analysis and then identifying uh, the appropriate controls to put in place. So examples um, of food allergens uh, that you may have come across would be milk, eggs, cereals containing gluten, uh, peanuts, etc. And so here I just want to remind you that in legal terms, European law recognises 14 of the most co common um, uh, European allergens. And your uh, food business is legally obliged to label food, whether it's uh, prepackaged or sold loose, with these 14 allergens. Um, and then just a brief word about other um, uh, about uh, foods that customers might be allergic to that aren't actually a part of the, the, the 14 or the list of uh, regulated 14 allergens. I suppose the advice there is never guess. If a customer says to you that they're allergic to something and, and asks you if you can prepare food um, safely for them, talk it through with them. Um, uh, but uh, later in this presentation, um, uh, we will be, um, uh, Carol will be talking about the, the 14 allergens and the, the guidance in the safe catering pack on how to, to uh, declare them and to control them. So how can you, so now we've discussed the, the hazards that you need to control, how can you manage them? And so the legislation is clear, um, Regulation 852 of 2004 says that you must develop and implement a food safety management system consisting of good hygienic practice. Um, uh, also, re we, we refer to, some of you may be referring to the uh, GHP as prerequisite programs, so PRPs. So I've included both terms there um, uh, because we're, we're coming across both commonly used. And then uh, 
procedures based on the principles of HACCP. So those are the two components um, that make up the, the foods, the principal components that make up a food safety management system. So I just want to um, uh, may maybe help you to stop and think about the, the, the three main elements of GHP or the, or the PRPs um, using these questions. Um, the where, um, so what's important is that the structure, the building, the room um, that you're working in uh, is, um, is appropriate for use. Um, it, you're able to, to control pests in it. So for example, even if you're opening a stall, in a, in a market that you have appropriate cover to pr protect your food from, from bird droppings. So those are the, the kind of things you need to think about from the very basic food stall through to um, a, a large catering premises. The who, well, this is all about um, your food handlers um, uh, being trained appropriately and understanding that they, they must report illness and not handle food if they have um, certain illness that could they could transmit through food. So if they have gastrointestinal symptoms, they shouldn't be handling food. Um, and then understanding that if they, they touch their, their head, um, they may be um, uh, transferring or, or uh, scratch their nose. They may be transferring organisms onto their food and they onto their hands, and they must make sure to wash their hands um, thoroughly before before handling food again. And then uh, the how. Um, well, this is about the operational hygiene. And so I suppose the, 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 the classic example is preventing cross-contamination. So pre preventing uh, contamination between um, raw foods and, and ready-to-eat foods by um, making sure you, you, you store uh, ready-to-eat foods safely away from, from raw foods. I'm going to go through through the seven principles of HACCP, um, using the example of a, a beef burger. So the hazard analysis um, here is harmful bacteria that could be present. And this example of the E. coli 0157 and the other um, uh, shigatoxin producing E. coli, we know that about 3% of minced meat in Ireland carries this organism. Um, and the difference for, um, between a, a steak and a beef burger is that in a steak, any contamination will be on the surface. Whereas with a beef burger, you mince, um, uh, you mince um, the meat up. Anything that was on the surface is now thoroughly um, uh, mixed into the centre. So it's important that um, uh, that a, a, a burger gets thoroughly cooked. So the cooking um, even through to the, the centre of the, of the burger. Um, so the, the critical control point example here is the cooking step that will destroy these harmful bacteria. The critical limit um, is to ensure that uh, the time and temperature that you use to, to cook the burger um, ensures that the thickest part of the burger reach, um, exceeds a temperature of, reaches or exceeds a temperature of 75 degrees, and that will destroy these harmful um, microorganisms. Then the fourth principle is monitoring. So periodically you check that the temperature has been reached. Now in practical terms, we're aware that in kitchens, um, uh, temperature programming every single food is, is, is not realistic. But periodically, and for example, at the start of the day, and when you're using, um, starting with a new batch of burgers, um, that you would aim to be of a similar size, um, uh, you will um, uh, temperature probe uh, typically the, the, the first batch and get a good idea of w whether or not um, the temperature and the time you're using is achieving the, the critical limit that you need to achieve. Corrective actions, um, um, this is the fifth principle, um, and in this case, um, if um, the burger it doesn't, it hasn't reached the temperature of 75, cooking for longer is the corrective action. Verification then is, is, is slightly different to monitoring. Verification is where periodically um, uh, the records are checked, um, activities are checked in the business, um, and the purpose of this is to make sure that the plan that was, that was designed is being implemented. So, for example, that monitoring is taking place at critical control points, and if um, critical limits are exceeded, that corrective actions are being taken. Um, and then the final um, principle is, is a docu documentation. So make sure you document um, the, the, the plan you have in place, uh, the controls you're going to follow, um, and keep records um, in, in terms of the monitoring that you're doing. So um, this slide is, I suppose, a summary slide to say that um, good hygienic practice and the prerequisite programs, that they form the foundation um, for the HACCP-based procedures. And the reason for this is that, that the majority of hazards are controlled by implementing good hygienic practice or, or PRPs. With HACCP, what you're doing is looking to see what could go wrong, making a plan on how you can prevent things from going wrong, and then checking and making sure that you're, you're doing what you said you were going to do.
So it's about putting extra attention and resources on the things that really are critical um, to food safety in, in your business. The good news is that the legislation is flexible and it recognises that um, businesses vary in the nature of the food they produce in terms of its risk and in the size um, of the business. So from that point of view, um, there are really three ways in which businesses can typically uh, comply with their obligation to have a food safety management system. Uh, so in some businesses, the nature of what they produce um, is such that there are no critical control points in the business and the hazard analysis identifies that GHP and PRPs alone um, should control the hazards effectively. So a typical example might be a corner shop where there's no food handling and um, there's prepackaged foods being sold. And so maintenance of the cold chain, make sh making sure that that cold food is kept cold um, is, is, um, is, is probably the, the principal um, uh, uh, prerequisite that, that needs to be in place. Use of recognised guides to good practice and um, where the hazards and controls have already been identified. And so the safe catering pack is an example of that. Um, and then there, of course, there are businesses that will decide themselves to um, develop their own food safety management system by sitting down and, and going through the seven principles um, at each step of their business. So um, uh, in terms of getting help um, in, in, in getting you past the, the blank page of setting up a food safety management system, clearly those national guides are, are, are a, great, um, uh, a great starting point. Um, many of you will be aware that the, Nat the National Standards Authority of Ireland has had uh, national guides available um, for many years now, for decades, <laughs> in fact. The um, IS 340 is a hygiene uh, guide in the catering sector. Um, and I'd just like to draw your attention to this um, for those of you who may be trainers or consultants. IS 342, which is a guide for, for processors, is um, due to be published shortly by NSAI. In the, the Food Safety Authority, what we've done is, is identified places where we feel there may be gaps. Um, and so um, Carol will explain in a lot, a lot more detail um, the safe catering pack and um, it's how its style is, I suppose, a simpler um, approach to, to using the standard IS340. Um, and it may be more appropriate for some businesses um, who are really struggling um, uh, to, you know, to, to get to, to grips with having a food safety management system. So with that, I'm going to finish my presentation um, and hand you over to, to Carol. So many thanks, Lisa. Um, as Lisa says, my name is uh, Carol and I'm going to go through the safe catering pack with you. So I'll just go off camera now and I'll come back on um, when my presentation is finished. So the safe catering pack. I'll go through um, the different um, sections of the pack, but especially the sections, as Lisa said, on allergens and acrylamide and other step sections, because these have been changed in the new newer pack. A review of the safe catering pack was carried out in 2018 and 2019, and this included a survey of caterers and environmental health officers. And a result, the results of this survey were used to produce the current 2020 version of the State Catering Pack. So here are the, some of the findings from the survey. And the survey was on the effectiveness of the State Catering Pack. And the survey found that the DVD explaining how to use the pack was not being used effectively, with 63% of caterers not using it at all. When asked how to, to best include food allergen controls in the pack, the majority, 59%, wanted the allergens to be dealt with separately in its own tab rather than at each step. We were thinking of making the pack digital, but the current paper-based format of folder and records was considered the most convenient way for caterers to access the pack. The main finding from the survey was that 91% of environmental health officers noticed improvements in food hygiene practices in food businesses using the pack. This is a brilliant endorsement of the Safe Catering Pack. The review was used to make changes to the pack, and I'll now go through uh, the pack with you so that you know how to use it as your food safety management system. It is not something to adorn a shelf in your office, but needs to be completed and used by you and your staff. The pack consists of a folder with six sections and comes with nine record books, SC1 to SC9, 
and a marker to fill in the sections relevant to your operation. Section one includes the pack, sorry, sorry, introduces the pack and sets out the responsibility for those uh, involved in the catering operation. The safe catering pack is designed principally for caterers as a practical, easy to use food safety management system, but it may also be used by other food businesses where it's relevant. Section two explains how to use the safe catering pack and what to do when you are filling it in. You need to keep in mind that the pack must be completed for it to be your food safety management system. The safe catering plan is in section three, where the steps of the operation and the hazards are set out. You need to review your menu and operation and tick the relevant colored boxes in the steps section. If one of the boxes does not apply to your operation, then the pages can be moved to the back of the pack for use later if your catering operation changes and you need those sections. These steps list the microbiological hazards. The hazards part of the safe catering plan includes the new allergen and acrylamide sections, as well as physical and chemical contamination. These hazards can exist at any step in the operation. There is an example given in the pack of how to fill in the storage step in the safe catering plan. HACCP and food safety management systems are usually associated with terminology that can be difficult to understand. And the PAC tries to address this by using plain language to explain HACCP terminology. It asks you to think about the following questions. What can go wrong? What can I do about it? How can I check? What if it's not right? After each step, there is additional food safety advice that should be read and followed. Some of the information in the steps and advice section has been changed in the 2020 version of the pack. If you have the older pack, just look at the FSAI website and these changes are outlined then, there. Gwen will talk about some of these later in the webinar. Section four covers the hygiene requirements that must be addressed and implemented by each food business. This includes instructing and training staff. Section five declaration is one of the most important parts of the pack. You need to sign the declaration of the completion and review of the safe catering pack, as this demonstrates that you are meeting the legal requirement to develop a food safety management system based on the principles of HACCP. You need to review the safe catering pack at least once a year, and also if the operation changes, for example, if you change your menu significantly, or if changes are made to the structure or layout of your premises. Section six contains master copies of the recording forms that are referenced throughout the pack. The recording forms are also available in colored booklets with a set supplied with the safe catering pack and available to purchase from the FSCI website when you run out. PDF versions of the forms can also be downloaded from the FSCI website. So now I'll just highlight some new sections that have been added to the safe catering plan or in the case of allergens and other steps expanded from the previous versions of the pack. The new sections are available to download from the FSAI website. So the other steps section now includes an example of how to complete the table for any steps in your operation that are not covered in those listed in the safe catering plan. The example given is sushi, as all the hazards associated with sushi are not controlled by the steps already listed in the safe catering plan and therefore, if you prepare sushi on your premises, then the table in the other steps section would need to be completed. Records for monitoring rice acidification and killing parasites have been included. The reason sushi was used as an example is that it is a detailed process and it outlines the many hazards that a food business needs to consider when carrying out a step. The pack provides signposting to useful resources when carrying out this, this hazard analysis task. And the Food Safety Authority website has, lo has lots of very helpful information for food businesses in this regard. If you're using the safe catering pack as your food safety management system, then it must contain all the steps in your operation. The allergen section takes account of both the legal requirement to provide allergen declarations on loose food for the 14 EU listed allergens and the requirement to control allergens as part of your food safety management system. This section includes the allergen table outlining hazards, controls, monitoring and records, and where necessary, the corrective action that needs to be carried out. Information on how to declare 
and manage allergens is also included. Allergens are one of the hazards that occur at all steps in your operation. The steps are grouped together where the same allergen control applies. For example, preparation, handling, cooking, reheating, and cooling. The importance of informing the consumer about allergens is paramount, as this allows them to make informed decisions about what they eat. This is reflected in the allergen table in the corrective actions. The Safe Catering Pack now includes FSAI allergen resources, namely the menu items allergen checklist and the Bee Food Allergen Aware poster. In addition, a new allergen controls review has been included, which lists allergen controls that should be carried out by the manager or supervisor regularly. Finally, just a brief introduction to the acrylamide section, covering the mitigation measures for small independent food businesses and franchises, which is contained in acrylamide legislation. These measures should be implemented to reduce the levels of acrylamide in food you produce to levels as low as reasonably achievable. As well as the table containing the mitigation measures for chips and potato products, bread and bakery products, and toast and grilled or toasted sandwiches, the pack also includes information on what acrylamide is and why it is a concern. So that's all from me. Many thanks for your attention and I'll now hand you over. Hello, my name is Gwen Basse. I'm a senior environmental health officer working for the HSC and I'm based in Dublin. I've been involved with the Safe Catering Pack from the original version through to the review in 2012 and the update in 2020. I'm going to discuss the pack from an environmental health officer's perspective. Next slide. In my presentation, there are three main areas that I'm going to cover. And these are some important tips when using the pack, elements of the pack that can be overlooked, and examples of important food safety information from the pack. Next slide. First of all, some important tips when using the pack. If you're using the safe catering pack, you must check to see it covers all the steps and activities in your business. If it doesn't, then you must do a hazard analysis on the step activity yourself. This can be done in the other steps section. Next slide. This is the other steps section, and it lists some examples of when it could be used. For example, if you're preparing sushi, doing sous vide, or vacuum packing. You have to complete the step yourself for each additional activity that you may be undertaking. There's also some very useful advice on sushi accompanying this section. Next slide. It is important to remember that a food safety management system is not a document developed for your inspector that just sits on the shelf until they visit. Legally, you must periodically check that the system is up to date. And if you change something, you need to check if you've introduced new hazards that need to be controlled. Next slide. Don't be afraid to record when things go wrong. And don't forget to record what you did about it. This example is a record sheet for the monitoring and recording of your delivery. What if you received a delivery of cooked chicken and when you checked the temperature, it was 10 degrees Celsius? This temperature is above the required critical limit and therefore action must be taken. This action should be recorded under the comments action column. Next slide. You must complete the pack not just the records. Environmental health officers will audit against what you said you would do in the pack. Go through all the advice accompanying each step and the hygiene requirements. Next slide. Remember to complete the pack, and the next slide will give you an example of the storage step. When completing this step, it is important to list examples of food that you use that are relevant to this step. Then you would look at number one, what can go wrong at each step? The hazard. Number two, 
what can I do about it that controls critical limits? In this case, you would need to tick the boxes for the options you choose. Number three, how can I check I am controlling the hazards? This is monitoring, monitoring verification. Again, you would need to tick the boxes for the options you choose. And finally, what if it's not right? This tells you what to do if something goes wrong and how to prevent it, ha it happening again. This is the corrective action. Next slide. The next area I'm going to look at is the elements of the pack that can be overlooked. The first thing I'm going to touch on is the supplier list. You must buy from a reputable supplier and maintain a list of your approved suppliers. The supplier list on page six of section three can be used to record these details. The pack gives you information of what you should be doing, looking at when choosing a supplier. It is important to review your supplier list regularly and amend it if a supplier changes. Next slide. Another important element that can be overlooked is the calibration of your temperature probe. You should calibrate your probe regularly to ensure it is accurate and working correctly. The temperature readings of your temperature probe should be recorded on the temperature probe calibration record as shown here. If you have more than one temperature probe, each probe should be identified by a reference number. The procedure for carrying out the calibration check is detailed in the pack. Another next slide, another important element of the pack is verification checks. The recording forms should be checked and signed off by a manager or supervisor. There is space at the bottom of each recording form to do this. Also, SC5, the hygiene inspection checklist, enables you to record your own checks of your premises from hygiene to food storage and record keeping, as well as many other checks. It should be carried out regularly by a manager or supervisor. Next slide. An important element of the pack to remember is that it can be used to instruct and train your staff. Your staff should know the, know the sections of the pack that are relevant to the job they do to ensure that the relevant practices and procedures are followed. Managers or supervisors responsible for the development and maintenance of your food safety management system must be adequately trained in its application. It is recommended that you keep records of all staff training. This form SC6, Hygiene and Training Records, can help you do this. Next slide. The pack also contains a fitness to work assessment form. Staff should be fit to work at all times. People who are not fit to work should, could spread food poison bacteria to food. This assessment form SC7 can be used for existing food handlers new food handlers on recruitment, and for return to work after an illness. Next slide. There's also a transport and delivery step in the pack. This step should be used if you're involved in the transport and delivery of hot, chilled, and frozen food. If you're supplying other food businesses, you need to speak to your environmental health officer for advice as other le legislation may apply to you. Next slide. Traceability. All food businesses must have an effective traceability system in place. You must be able to trace food one step back to your suppliers, and if you're supplying food to other food businesses, one step forward to your customers. You can record traceability details on SC1, your food delivery record, including batch code for food of animal origin. Traceability information must be kept at least until it can be reasonably assumed that the food has been consumed. Next slide. The final element is the review of the pack. You must review your pack periodically and whenever you make a change that could impact food safety or when processes or activities change. For example, if you get involved in the transport and distribution of food. It must be reviewed at least once a year. Remember to include review dates on the declaration and review in section five, page one. Next slide. Finally, I'm going to give some examples of important food safety information from the pack. 
first of all, is shelf life. The shelf life of, of prepared chilled food is two days, with day of production, day zero. Therefore, if, if food is produced on Monday, day zero, Tuesday is day one, and Wednesday is day two. Any, any food not served at the end of day two must be disposed of. The shelf life of frozen food is maximum six months, depending on the star rating of your freezer. Next slide. In the cooking step, references as to whether poultry, processed meat, and meat is pink or red as a way of assessing it is thoroughly cooked has been removed. This is based on EFSA opinion that checking food in color Checking for colour in food is not a reliable method to determine whether it's thoroughly cooked or not. Next slide. With regard to eggs, you need to cook eggs and food containing eggs thoroughly until they are piping hot. Eggs can contain food poisoning bacteria, for example salmonella. If you cook them thoroughly, this kills any bacteria. The Food Safety Authority of Ireland recommends the use of pasteurised egg in any food that will not be cooked or lightly cooked, for example, mayonnaise and mousse. Eggs produced under the Board B Quality Assurance Scheme are the next basis source. Next slide. And finally, when cooling food, the temperature of 5 degrees has been removed from the control critical limit for cooling. The control is the cooling step. The control in the cooling step is to reduce the temperature of cooked food as quickly as possible after cooking and place it in the fridge within two hours. Do not put foods that are not sufficiently cooled into the fridge as this may raise the temperature of the fridge and cause condensation. These are just some examples of important food safety information from the pack. There are many, many more. Final slide. Thank you for your attention. I am now going to hand you back over to Lisa for the Q&A. Thank you very much, Gwen. Um, and uh, just to um, highlight for those of you who aren't familiar with the, the controls there, if anybody wants to submit a question, if you could just pop it into the questions box. Um, I think we have one already. I'm just going to uh, pop this out here. So uh, the first question we've received is, is on, on training, um, and I suppose it's it's specifically on online courses. Um, so the person said they they couldn't find any um, any ones that are doing that they're doing only half course or some not covering everything. I but I suppose it's a challenge for a course I suppose to cover everything. Um, uh, the safe catering pack itself, particularly the advice sections. Um, are certainly um, uh, materials that can be used to, to train. Um, and then I suppose separately, FSAI has e-learning modules on very specific areas like packaging materials, additives, uh, and um, uh, microbiological criteria, um, and labeling. So I suppose that the truth of it is that there may be no one one specific um, place. Um, I'm just looking at Carol there, um, whether or not you want to, to, to say anything, um, add anything to, to that response. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I suppose the, the requirement um, really is that the food handlers are supervised and instructed and or trained in food hygiene matters commensurate with their work activity. So the, the advice we'd always give is that it's really Gwen and her colleagues, when they go in, they need to see that you're demonstrating um, it. So it's not really necessarily the course you go on, but you being able to demonstrate what you've learned in that course and the hygiene requirements within within the the um, in the premises is the main thing. Um, as Lisa says, there are lots of um, uh, documents and resources on the FSAI website that could be used, including the training guides that go through all of what should be part of kind of training programs. So they, they can be used. But as I say, um, I think uh, for Gwen, I might hand over to you, Gwen, it's really that you need to be seeing that it's it's demonstrated when you go into the workplace. Absolutely, Carol. That is the important aspect of training. You know, we need to see evidence that like you, yourself and food workers are applying all the information that they would have learned in training courses or even they are reading the safe catering pack in action so we need to see that it is that you are demonstrating all the skills that you have learned 
that's that's the important thing. You know, it's like training obviously is very, very important, but the very you know, it's very important that you do demonstrate and you do apply all the skills and knowledge that you learned in action. And that is the main thing that we will be looking at, that we do look for when we're doing inspections. You know, and it is as part of inspections, um, food workers or food managers, supervisors can be asked and it can be asked for like, like what is the temperature, what temperature should food be cooked to, what temperature should food be uh, stored at. This is just to try and demonstrate for an environmental health officer to try and get some um, some knowledge of the level of um, knowledge that the food workers have and just to make sure that the food workers know how to produce safe food and they know the required temperatures and the required critical limits. Okay, Gwen, thanks very much for that. We actually have quite a lot of questions. So I'm just going to, the next one is a question about food handlers certificates. And I might take this um, just to say, it's not a legal requirement um, to have a certificate. Um, uh, and I, I'm assuming this is about fitness to work certificates as opposed to training certificates, but um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So, and, and apologies for the dog, <laughs> sorry. Um, but so it's, it's not a, a legal requirement to have um, a, a fitness to work certificate but it's it's we have that in the form in the in the safe catering pack to prompt really um, managers to remember that it's it's important to uh, make staff aware that they shouldn't be handling food if they're unwell and and to keep an eye on you know maybe somebody's gone on holidays and they they had some when they came back and um, uh, maybe they did have a, a bout of gastrointestinal um, illness so and then if you're talking about training certificates, I mean, that's for you to, 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 to manage in your records, just to keep track of, of what's been trained or who's, who's been trained. Um, so um, there's a, a may contain question here, um, which I might give to Carol. So what is your recommendation on may contain in relation to food allergens as a consumer? It is very unhelpful, yet it is hard to avoid from a GMP perspective. Um, would love if it was removed. So, Carol, on may contain, please. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, no, it is it is a real issue for for um, people um, because, like you say, it removes um, a lot of choice um, from consumers. And I suppose, but you have to recognise there are some um, like serve over counters and places like that where it is practically impossible to be able uh, to guarantee that there hasn't been any cross contamination. So our advice would always be to, you know, to be to be very pragmatic about the use of uh, may may contains because it does really reduce um, the, the choice for, for consumers. And there is advice in the safe catering pack, especially in relation to controls, because um, the actual allergen section was a really difficult section um, to produce. And it took an awful long time um, with the environmental health uh, with, with Gwen and her colleagues and with, with Pat O'Mahony and the FSCI as well, who's kind of the expert in this area, to try and come up with that exact reason to, to kind of come up with controls that were reasonable, that took into account the, the needs of the consumer and also took into account um, the difficulties that, that there can be in relation to controls in certain environments. Um, so there is lots of tips there to caterers about how they can reduce um, the, the use of these kind of blanket statements and the FSI would not um, encourage the use of, of blanket statements um, for allergens for, for the exact reason for that. So where, um, in, in the uh, safe catering pack there, there is information um, in relation to that and I can send it to, um, to Elaine and, and she can send you on what, what it says in there but yes it, it, is, it is an issue and it's a balance between the controls that you put in place and consumer choice. Okay, thanks, Carol. The, the next question um, I think might be for Gwen. Do we have to fill out each page for every step, for every item we prepare and cook, or just a selection? Well, no, I, and I suppose you're probably talking about the examples of food. No, you just basically, at the top of each step, you would give the examples. Say, say the first step is your, trans, is your delivery. Give some examples of the food that you might get delivered into your premises. And then you basically go through each step and you say, what do I do here? So, for example, do you have a list of your um, approved suppliers? And if you, if you do, then you tick that. But you don't have to do it for every item of food. You just do it for, for all the food that you produce, basically. So I'd say in say, most restaurants, you would probably do the same thing. 
when you get food in, when you get a uh, deliver food in, you check the temperature. So you would tick that, like as your control that you check the temperature of deliver of your deliveries to make sure that five degrees. But that would incorporate all the food that you get in and your and that that you get in in your deliveries. So you don't have to do it for each item of food. You just list. All the some uh, some examples, obviously not everything, but some examples of the food that you are getting on your delivery. So, for example, if you get cooked meat in, if you get raw meat in, and then you go through the steps, but you do it for all the food that you get that you get delivered into your premises. You don't have to do it for each item of food. Hopefully, that's Thanks. clear. Thanks very much, Gwen. I'm conscious um, it's 10.42 now. Um, we have two other questions that I, I might try and slip in. Um, but for those of you who, who might have to leave um, uh, at, at this time, I just want to remind you that as you leave, um, there will be a survey will pop up. So we, we would really appreciate if you could fill that in. Um, but I'm just going to try and slip in those two other questions. Um, there's an, EHOs have been asking for water to be included in the hazard analysis. Could this be assessed in one step, like the approach you've taken to acrylamide in the safe catering pack? Um, I think the answer to that is, is really that the pack is for, for you to adapt to be appropriate to your business. Mm -hmm. And if, if that makes sense to you, um, and Gwen, I think maybe if, if you have a perspective yeah. on that. Yeah, I think yeah, it can be sort of maybe added as, you can put it in as, as the other step. Um, it's just obviously important, it's a very, water is a very important component of your food business and you have to be able, to demonstrate to your food, um, your environmental health officer, that the food, the water that you're using uh, for drinking water and for washing food is a potable supply. So um, you could include it as uh, as part of this, the extra step that I would have discussed in my presentation. It's just for you, as a food business, you do need to do your own risk assessment. And you'd look at your water, say within your kitchen, what tap do you use for your drinking water? What tap do you use to wash food? And it's important, obviously, that this is a potable water supply, so it's, it is from a rising main, that it's not that the food, the water isn't held in the storage tank, because if you if you hold water in a storage tank for prolonged periods, it can lead to bacterial growth, so it can be very then hazardous if people drink it or if, you're, or if it's used to wash food. So it can be used, it can be, the risk assessment can form as part of the extra, the other step section of the pack. It's, uh, hopefully that's clear enough. Thanks very much. And then um, uh, the last question is on um, acrylamide. So somebody's saying if a customer wants and insists um, that they want toast darker, what can you do? And legally, what is the position? Um, so um, my impression is that um, the legislation is aiming to try and reduce gradually exposure to acrylamide. Um, uh, but you know, I, I appreciate that if, if a customer is demanding something, uh, you are a business at the end of the day. But it's it's about over you know in an overall way trying to make it as easy as possible for the customer to be exposed to as little acrylamide as possible. Um, I don't know if either Gwen or, or Carol or Gwen maybe if, if there's anything else to add on, on that one. Yeah, I suppose yeah, I know. Uh, and sorry, sorry Gwen. Sorry, sorry. Um, it does. Yeah. It does have that question in it. What do you do if your customer is not happy with light golden chips? Um, because there is a, an actual color chart within the pack that shows you the different uh, levels and what what you should be selling um, in order to to, to mitigate. Um, and the the I suppose the advice that we gave was that like just like what you said, Lisa is you know we would recommend that starchy food is cooked to a light golden colour, um, and just to make the customers aware of this and the risks involved with being exposed um, in too much acrylamide. But that that's kind of all that 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 you can do. And there was a question there about sampling as well in acrylamide and no, um, I suppose the guides uh, or the guidelines that are in the Safe Catering Pack uh, relate to small businesses and franchises. Um, so there, there isn't a sampling requirement there, but within the acrylamide legislation, depending on the type of business you are and if you're manufacturing, there are different requirements. So depending on what type of business you, you uh, run, come on to the to the FSCI website and there is a, a section there on acrylamide and lots of resources and you can then find out depending on the food business that you have what uh, what requirements there are so hope that helps you sorry Gwen I think you were going to say something as well no 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 that's fine I think you've covered everything Carol 
Okay, I, I, so um, I think we're going to, to leave it at that. Thank you for your very active participation. Those were really useful questions. Um, um, and uh, just to remind you, um, we would appreciate if you could fill in um, the survey at, at the very end. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, and if you have joined this event, um, just to remind you, if you're not already subscribed to our events, you can subscribe on our, on our website. So thanks again. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.